We look at a speedy right-handed center on today's episode. The prospect spotlight is on Michael Hage for today's episode of Locked On NHL Prospects. You are Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On this podcast, we break down everything prospects to a few, five days a week, Monday to Friday. I'm Hattie Kalakesh, joined by Sebastian High, and on today's show, we'll be breaking down the prospect profile for Michael Hage for the 2024 NHL Draft. We're talking about a six foot one, 190 pound right-handed center playing for the Chicago Steel in the USHL. We'll start off with the breakdown of his puck skills, his skating, uh, the shot, uh, stick handling, all that good stuff. In our first segment, then in our second segment, we'll get into uh, the, the more intricate elements of his game, the toolkit, the habits, the decision making, all that good stuff. And then in our final segment, we'll break down uh, the projection with Michael Hage, what the upside looks like, uh, what the likelihood of hitting that upside is like, and which team would be the best fit. Before we get into any of that, though, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. We just hit a thousand subscribers. Help us grow some more. Uh, and if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, make sure to make us your first listen of the day and leave us a rating and review. It helps the channel out a lot. So let's get things started here with the profile for Michael Hayes. Talk me through the playing style a bit with Hayes. We already know the size and handedness. What what are the point totals looking like? Has he heated up recently? Uh, and um, what kind of player are we talking about here? For sure. So Michael Hage is a dynamic and very toolsy centerman. Uh, in his last 10 games, he's logged eight goals and 20 points. Uh, he's playing with, Chicago, with the Chicago Steel in the USHL, and uh, that is excellent production on a not-so-excellent team this season. While it's a program that has routinely been turning out high-level prospects and winning a ton of games in the USHL over the past five seasons, this year's lineup is a little bit weaker than typical. So uh, Hage yeah. leads the team in points with 68 this season through 50 games, uh, 31 goals, 37 assists uh, in those point totals. And he's one of just three players with over 60 points this season, who are also the only three players with more than 40 points this season. So it's been a team led by just a couple players uh, with Michael Hage, Charlie Major, and Mick Thompson. But Hage is really quite dynamic. He is very toolsy. The puck skills are very strong, as we're going to dig into in this segment. And on top of that, he adds really impressive skating ability, mobility in all four directions, quite explosive already for his age. He's fairly physically mature. Uh, and on top of all that, also has a pretty high level of composure. And he showed a lot of these skills in his D-2 season when he was playing with the Toronto Junior Canadians in AAA hockey. Uh, and while he missed almost his entire D-1, only playing 13 games last season with the Chicago Steel, he will be off to the University of Michigan next season, which is an excellent development program and should be an excellent place for him to take Take the following steps in his development path yeah absolutely um and yeah you mentioned the chicago steel i mean turning off great talent we're talking about you know the likes of macklin celebrini and adam, adam fantilli and uh the middle stat brothers i believe were played with there as well so you know lots of talent coming through that sean farrell as well has been playing pretty good for the laval rock it. So, uh, yeah, great development program. And uh, speaking of development, I feel like you've developed a fairly amount over the year. Um, but before I get into kind of how this game has progressed, I want to talk about the puck skills for a second because there's a lot to love there. Um, a really multifaceted offensive player. We'll start with the stick handling ability because I think that's the best in his tool uh, in his tools uh, offensively. Um, the stick handling is really, really good. I love the range of motion. I love his ability to go from right to left really quickly, really accurately. He's able to make deeks inside of pass receptions, which isn't something you see often with uh, young prospects, especially some, especially prospects, you know, ranked at the highest at 20th, um, in, in, you know, preemptive rankings for the 2024 NHL draft, his ability to quickly, you know, make a, make a deke inside of a motion is really, really good. Um, 
great sense of timing as well on those deeks uh although there there are some there is some rawness in when he chooses which type of deke i think that overall the stick handling ability is a big strength uh shooting wise i think uh he's got a lot to bring to the game he's got what 31 goals in 58 58 games uh yeah sorry 31 goals in 50 games and a lot of the goals i've watched have been mid-range curl and drag wristers one timers um you know quick shots in transition he blends his shot uh, with his emotions really, really well. He's able to shoot in motion really well. So, yeah, the shot is, um, you know, a decent element of his game. So stick handling wise, give him a good seven, seven and a half. I really like the stick handling ability. The shot's a good six, six and a half. It's above NHL average. I, I could see him score 25, 30 goals in the NHL if everything goes well. Um, but what do you think about the passing? I, I've had I've had mitigated viewings uh, passing wise on my end. I mean, I've watched a decent amount of tape in, in his very recent stretch of form, so it's quite possible that my evaluations here are a bit more optimistic than yours because uh, the videos have been very strong. Um, but I really like the passing ability. Uh, he's been employing a lot more give and goes than I saw from earlier on this season. There were flashes earlier on in the season before he basically had a wake-up call that got him to play a far more like refined two-way game where he was really trying to play triple a style hockey in the ushl trying to do everything on his own and yeah. throughout the early stretch of this season, he was really integrating a lot more mature habits in this game as we'll discuss in the next segment but that gave him a really strong foundation for uh that that give and go play that he's been using really effectively in recent mm -hmm. weeks and uh he's quite quick with his passing he blends his passing and handling ability and skating ability really 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 nicely together in unison uh and on top of that i've liked the playmaking creativity a ton this season he's been integrating a ton of delays in his on puck game in the offensive zone looking to create small little openings in defensive structures and very confidently attacks those with uh with, with a variety of passing tools in his arsenal whether it be a hook pass or um or, or saucer pass like he he's really been integrating a ton of versatility in that playmaking game and he's had to because the Chicago Steel team just isn't the strongest this season and has often been relying on his individual brilliance to deconstruct opposing defensive structures so for sure I, I think for, for the for the passing overall tool uh, grade I'd probably give him like a seven as well like I think mm -hmm. most of his tools including the passing and uh, including the, the skating and the overall puck skills like all three of them I think right at six and a half to seven and a half in that range yeah, for sure. I, I, I agree with you in the sense that this is what I've seen from him at his best. But there are some games that I've seen from him this season where the passing looks more like a four, where he's, you know, not setting up his passes with, with the right deeks, even though he's able to, um, you know, he's selecting his passes uh, very strangely as well. Um, and sometimes just not connecting on really easy passes to make. Um, so th the passing has been really inconsistent to me. I'd give it kind of a six, six and a half based on that inconsistency, because I know that he's able to do more. Um, and maybe it's a result of playing with the level of teammates he's been playing with this year. But, you know, there are some there are a lot of inconsistencies there. And I, I want to see more consistency in those elements. And I think a lot of it comes through the toolkit and the habits and the decision making, which we'll get into in our second segment. But just before we close off on this first one, uh, what do you think of the skating? Because there are some elements of a skating that I find fascinating. Um, the crossover usage, the ability to just blow through opponents. The skating is really fluid and really powerful, right? It is. I think that like mechanically, he's a very strong skater. Uh, he's also very agile in all four directions, and that makes it a lot easier for him to get around but using those crossovers too. He's so comfortable in crossovers in both directions. He doesn't really favor one leg over the other either, which is nice to see. Yeah. And it's the explosiveness is really where his lower body strength like shines. He's able to really gain separation in his first two strides, uh, especially at the, like, at the USHL level. There are few players on the ice that can match his explosiveness in a couple strides. And in a lot of the games that I've, I've been watching, uh, like quite a few of them have, have also been against the NTDP. And even against the NTDP, I've always thought that, that, that Hage has been one of, if not the best skater on the ice. And that's a program that turns yeah. out some really, like, peculiar skaters in many ways but very very efficient and effective skaters so uh even playing yeah. against like some d-minus ones that move really well like james Hagens and um 
Logan Hensler as well. Like, like even against playing like, like, like those guys who move around the ice wonderfully, uh, Hage stands out with how he moves around the ice. He's really, really effective. Like, I like both the input and the output in his stride, and it's been a seven grade tool all season long for me. Same here. That wraps things up for our first segment. We'll get into our second where we talk about the toolkit, the habits, the decision making, all that good stuff. We'll get into that right after these messages from our sponsors over at Sleeper. We're past the halfway point of the NHL season now with the trade deadline in the rearview mirror, but there's still time to get in on the action with Sleeper. Sleeper is our number one choice here at the Locked On NHL Podcast Network for all of your daily fantasy hockey needs. That's because with Sleeper, you have the chance to win 100 times your money in uh, daily fantasy hockey contests. And all you need to do to win that is to correctly predict the outcome of eight specific player stats. And you can get really creative with those and have some fun. Whether you want to bet on the stars of the league, like, I don't know, Nathan McKinnon, who just had another 17-plus game point streak this season, or Nikita Kucherov, who continues to light it up or maybe even stay a bit more in line with the theme of this podcast and bet on the young studs of the league, like Leo Carlson and Connor Bedard. The choice is yours with Sleeper. Use promo code LOCKEDONNHL and you'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. That's code LOCKEDONNHL. See Sleeper's terms of use for details and locational availability. Alrighty, so moving on to our second segment, we'll get into the toolkit, the habits, the decision making, and how those project in uh, Michael Hage's game. I like to call this a kind of mental uh, segment of our uh, of our prospect profiles. Uh, there's a lot to dissect here with Michael Hage. I think we can start with the toolkit, uh, so how his tools inter interact. I think offensively, the skills blend so well. I think that you know the ability to move at a high pace and make plays at a high pace is pretty interesting. Um, you know, in terms of his ability to stick handle at a high speed, to pass at a high speed, to shoot at a high speed is decent. Um, but the way the, the decision making at a high speed, I do have issues with. Um, there are times where he'll cut inside a player where he should be cutting outside. There are times where he'll be cutting outside where he should be cutting inside. And overall, for me, there's a there's a consistent um, lack of kind of mindfulness when it comes to which rush patterns he decides on you know he's a very incisive player he loves to cut through opponents but when you're doing that you need to read the opponent's feet you need to see are their feet planted are they are his toes facing left are they facing right right now he's so fast and skilled that it doesn't matter uh what his opponents are doing so i don't think he's really reading uh, what's going on. I think he'll go for what he wants to go for no matter what. But as he climbs the ranks, as he faces more more mobile, more capable, more rangy defensemen, it's going to get harder and harder and harder for him to be able to make those those rush patterns work regardless. He'll need to be a lot more mindful with which, which patterns he chooses. Um, in terms of habits, is there anything that concerns you with, uh, with Hage's game? Yeah, I mean, especially earlier on this season, uh, as you mentioned, there was often a lack of calculation behind the decisions he was making, and it was perhaps a bit more improvised of scanning around, like he has decent enough scanning habits, scanning around for options when he sees something just goes for it, rather than having specific plans to create options or to look off options and hang on to the puck himself and to really think of where he's factoring in in space on puck. I do think that the off puck decision making offensively is a decent step up from the uh, from from the on puck decision making, which gives me some room for optimism uh, in how he's going to progress on that front. I really like his ability to read defensive structures and find soft ice in the offensive zone, to stick in defensive blind spots, to really make himself a little pocket of soft ice, and he's very capable at making those micro adjustments to stay in it, to stay in a passing lane, to give his teammate an option uh, in an, in a high danger area when he does doesn't have the puck on his stick, but as you mentioned, the on-puck decision-making can be a little bit erratic and a bit neuro neurotic even at times, so uh, there's definitely yeah. room to grow there, but at the same time, I I'm quite hopeful because the University of Michigan is one of the better programs in the country at teaching players specifically these smaller details uh, in like offensive rush patterns, in on-puck habits, in... Um, overall decision-making in the offensive zone. And we've seen a ton of players that perhaps 
had flashes of brilliance on that front going into their college careers, really become a lot more consistent uh, in those facets as they matured in uh, with, with the University of Michigan. I'm thinking of players like Gavin Brindley, for instance, and I'm hopeful that Michael Hage will be able to integrate a lot of those more mature, refined, calculated habits on the puck with time. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned the off puck hab- elements. I think he's, you know, he, st- he spent the first half of the season working really hard to be a two way player. And I don't think that was necessarily, you know, although it, it really helped to develop those elements in this game and make him capable of being of being able to, you know, defend the rush, you know, defend in zone, you know, win face offs, you know, be that responsible element on the line. I don't think that's really the type of player he's going to become at the NHL level. If he's able to do it in flashes, if he's able to contribute defensively even better, that's another, you know, that's another arrow in his quiver, right? But overall, Hage is a skilled guy. That's where he shines in transition in the offensive zone get him the puck, he'll make things happen. That's really what I like to see from Hage and what I'd like to see him kind of work on and improve moving forward because the better he gets in that element, the better he's going to be in the NHL level. Um, But I'm really still impressed with the off-puck decision-making, with the ability to kind of funnel opponents into his teammates, Um, He kind of shepherds opponent, like off the rush, if there's a puck carrier coming his way, he'll direct him towards the side of the ice that has the most of his teammates to make sure that, you know, he's kind of, He's kind of funneling players into potential turnovers and that kind of stuff. That's one thing I really, really like about Hage's um, overall decision making and transition defensively in the in his own zone. Really active stick, really smart stick, really puts his stick in the right lanes. Um, and I haven't really seen him layer his physicality into his his, his interventions as much. Uh, I wouldn't call him kind of a physical guy, even though he is 6'1", 190. Um, but that's another thing that he can develop with time. And I think that he could get good at this is really kind of leaning into guys physically using his physicality along the boards to get off of the boards and and kind of turn pucks over and make plays in, in the middle of the ice so you know there's room for improvement on the off puck game and the defensive game but it's still something that he's explored a ton this year especially in the first half where he was kind of doing his best to be the most responsible element on that team um and you know f- for me I don't think there's anything really concerning with his decision making and habits I just think there are things that aren't there yet um, but there are things that could limit him from, you know, reaching, for example, a top line. I, I, you know, I, I have a, I have a lot of trouble seeing Michael Hayes on the top line, um, due to some, some of these decision-making elements and all that stuff. But, you know, how likely do you think it is that Hage develops these decision-making elements, these habits, this toolkit even further, um, in the next kind of three, four years as he develops in the NCAA? I mean, I don't know just how likely it is. Like what I have been looking at this season has been his trajectory. Like he went from a D minus one player that had a bunch of these tools, but they were not a a cohesive toolkit in any way, shape or form coming into the season. And uh, while he did show off a lot of his brilliance in AAA hockey with those Toronto junior Canadians, it just hadn't come together just yet. And injuries really prevented him from, from getting the reps needed to, to, to make all of his tools come together cohesively. And I've seen a lot of progr- progression on that front this season, which makes me a lot more hopeful on the likelihood of the upside. I think like the raw upside being well inside the top six has been there all along. It's more about how consistent can he play? How, uh, how impactful can he be on a shift by shift basis and how can he leverage his tools really effectively against competition? So I've been seeing a lot more of that as as the seasons progressed and he's just been accelerating like, like a snowball going down a hill. Uh, And, and as the season's gone on and I mean, he's at two points a game over his last 10 at this point. And he's been like the most threatening offensive player in all of my three viewings over that, that 10 game stretch. And he's been playing some pretty good teams right like the NTDP was in there so uh i i think i'm a bit more optimistic at this stage than you are but i've also caught less uh, questionable feelings than you have so we'll we'll, we'll yeah. see how he keeps pro- progressing but i think that especially because he is going to the university of michigan and like they're just so consistent at being able to refine players and uh, like encourage players to double down on their strengths which is exactly <laughs> what hage needs in his development at this point yeah, for sure. Fully agreed. Um, that wraps things up for our second segment. We'll get into our third, where we talk about the projection, the upside, and which team would be the best fit for Michael Hage. Right after these messages from our sponsors here at Locked On NHL Prospects.
Alrighty, so closing things off here with our breakdown of Michael Hage's projection, the upside, and which team would be the best fit. We can start with the projection. For me, I really see Hage as a middle six skill guy. You know, I see a lot of, um, you know, elements where he's he's going to be at times the best player on the ice, but not consistently enough for him to be a bona fide first liner. Um, you know, the type of guy who's going to carry pucks in transition to, you know, play on the half wall and perhaps the top power play and just rifle pucks consistently at the net uh, while also connecting with his teammates fairly well at times. Um, do you see any chance in, in your opinion that there is a top line player here? I do on the wing. I, I don't think if, if he does crack the top line, he's not going to be the one C, but I, I, I've seen enough from him in terms of like high end composure on puck being able to allow a, 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 ex, a gravitational pull on his opponents, uh, take in that pressure, make a pass through it or around it using his pretty diverse passing arsenal and his handling skill and his skating ability. The tools are all, top six caliber in terms of projection in my eyes. And I've seen the habits refine over the course of the season. And I think that the composure is a really good foundation for him to build off of. Is he a slam dunk top six guy or, or, or potential top, top line winger? No, but I've seen enough flashes of just like brilliant skill and brilliant awareness and execution on, uh, on particular offensive zone sequences that I do see that, 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 pretty impressive top six upside with some fringe top line potential. But uh, I, I, yeah, I've been a pretty big fan. He's been uh, inside my top 20 for the last couple of weeks at this point, uh, which I know is a decent bit higher than where you have him at, at, at this stage in the draft cycle. And uh, I, I will say that, that our USA scout, David Saad has, has gotten into my ear a little bit uh, with Michael Hage. And yeah. I've been starting to really see a lot of, of just wonderful upside in his game. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, the upside is, is certainly there. I just, for me, it's the likelihood of him hitting it is, I don't know, it, especially as a top line winger. I think that, you know, I, I, I do get shades of Jonathan Duran from him at times where it's like, you, you're, you're really, really skilled, dude. Just, just a tiny bit more engagement, a tiny bit more involvement, a tiny bit better decision making. Um, He's the type of player who uh, really, I mean, when he's on his game, it's it's amazing to watch. But like, there's there's a significant lack of consistency for me. He hasn't been the same player all year, and his his effort level, his engagement, his decision making has really wavered massively. Um, I'd say even more than a guy like Trevor Conley, you know, or um, John Mustard or Sasha Bovar. Like those guys are decent. Um, especially regarding Sasha Bovard, I think the two can be fairly comparable regarding, you know, two players who are playing in the USHL in their draft year, um, are producing fairly well, are good goal scoring centers, but project better as wingers, that kind of thing. Um, for me, Bovard has just been a lot more consistent, a lot more defensively engaged and smart. Um, and I think his game is very much further along than Hage's. But Hage sure. has pure, pure skating ability, pure skill that Bovard doesn't really have. Um, so yeah, there, there's a, there's a significant issue for me with the, the level of engagement and consistency in that, uh, with Hage. Uh, but regarding the NHL fit, I do want to talk about this quite a bit because we do have a lot of options here, depending on where he ends up going. I could see him go as high as 15. I could see him go as low as the middle of the second round. You yeah. know, there's, there's a big range big for range. Hage. First, let's talk about where you think he'll end up realistically on, on draft day. Uh, I'm going to go actually with the same team where I mocked them in, in last week's mock draft, the Nashville Predators. This is an organization that has been very vocal about their desire to take big swings on upside. We saw at the at the draft last year where they spent where they spent their two first round draft selections on Matthew Wood and Tanner Melendic, and were even like trying desperately to trade up into the top five, top ten uh, to acquire high end talent. And I think that Michael Hage is right up their alley. They already have a lot of defensively capable players in their system, and I think that Michael Hage's combination of elite level tools, as well with uh, as his flashes of high end composure and the likely development that he's going to get at the University of Michigan, will be very enticing to a team like the Predators. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I, I, however, I do look at the Toronto Maple Leafs. I not only think that this would be the the most likely fit, I also think this would be the best fit 
um, for for uh, Michael Hage because I look back at their selection. I think in the third round a couple of years ago, Nick Moldenhauer, who was also from the Chicago Steel, uh, who has been developing fairly well. I, I see Toronto as a team that is likely to take players from good development programs, uh, a, a, a team that's looking for good development programs from which to kind of get their players. And Michael H. fits the build really, really well. He's the type of player that will be available in the 20 to 30 range that you can definitely take a swing on as a, a contender or a bubble contender um, that can potentially slot into your top six in the future if you develop them well. And I know for a fact that Toronto has some of the best development staff in the world. So, um, I think this would be not only a great fit for the Leafs, but a great fit for Michael Hage, who would benefit a lot from a program like this. Um, also, the way it's trending right now, it seems like the uh, first round pick that the Montreal Canadiens are getting from the Winnipeg Jets will be in the kind of yeah. 25 range. Uh, that's another likely destination for him that I think would be great. Uh, the Habs also have some great development staff. Adam Nicholas literally worked for the Chicago Steel and still does to some extent um, work for the Chicago Steel. So the connection there is very clear and obvious. Outside of this, uh, I think the Dallas Stars would have a field day with uh, with Michael Hage. Yeah, I think they'd have a blast with him, right? They really would. I mean, they've, they've been taking a lot of those players that combine high-end tools with flashes of high-end processing ability and composure. Like, I'm thinking, like, both Maverick Bork and Wyatt Johnston in, in their draft years were very toolsy, but still had some things to put together. There were still some question marks and development that needed to take place. And while yep. Maverick Bork has still yet to make his NHL debut, he is one of the leading point scorers in the AHL and is likely going to make the jump to the NHL as soon as this season or maybe in the fall. Uh, and on top of that, obviously, Wyatt Johnston is a pretty good NHLer already. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, in, in terms of fits, I, I don't really see many, you know, I, like I said, I, I see many options, but in, in terms of the teams that are picking in the 33 to 40 range, if ever Michael Hayes slips out of the first round, there aren't a lot of options that I would see as realistic. I would say perhaps, you know, do the San Jose Sharks go for a player like this? I know we talk about them a lot, but you know, let's give them some hope here. Do, do we? We, we have San Jose to. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. yeah. No, I, I mean, they, they went with Quentin Musty last season, and and, and I think of all the players uh, between draft classes, if you're doing uh, comparisons, perhaps not stylistic, but in terms of like profile and strengths and weaknesses, that would be a link that I can draw uh, in terms of like really high end tools kind of inconsistent decision making some real warts and, and immaturity in some areas of their games but just like this electric level of skill and mobility and flashes of physicality and quentin musty is it led the ohl in points per game this season and ended up with 100 points so i think that san jose could definitely be enticed at taking another big swing on upside and hage would be just that I'd also say that, that that their state rivals would be another pretty good fit. And the Anaheim Ducks, uh, they always love mining high upside talent. And while they have been picking a little bit more out of like Europe and the CHL in recent years, I think Michael Hage would be a really nice fit into their overall philosophy at the draft. For sure. Uh, those are definitely a couple options, but that wraps things up for today's show. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Leave us a comment letting us know what you want us to talk about next. And if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, make sure to make us your first listen of the day. For your second listen of the day, make sure to check out Locked On Sports today. They've got all your updates and news about what's going on around sports. And make sure to tune in for our next show as we break, as we break down Tijik Inla's game uh, for the 2024 NHL Draft. This has been Hattie Kalakesh with Sebastian High, and we hope you tune in next time.